video production services at HR Tech Tank in New York City, sponsored by Recruitify, a unique new category of recruiting that connects top recruiters with companies looking to hire exceptional talent. Learn more at Recruitify.com. Uh, I've run sales, marketing, etc. I've been on the consulting and analyst side now for five or six years. Uh, my firm was acquired by the Star Conspiracy and sits within uh, the intelligence unit. Uh, the, uh, an event that I run is called Influence HR. It is a consortium for marketers in the space. So we uh, get together uh, once a year, uh, usually around HR Tech, we'll be with the HR Tech Conference in Vegas this year, embedded with them. If you're attending that one, you know, look us up. We're, we're working on the agenda now. The intelligence unit is, is um, part of the Star Conspiracy, which is a marketing agency. The domain experience that we have is deep. Uh, we focus on B2B strategic marketing. It's almost all in the human capital market space. So for over uh, 12 years, my friend Brett Starr, who's the founder of the firm, uh, has been working almost exclusively uh, with uh, HR technology shops and bringing them to market. Uh, our mission is to change there is to change B2B marketing forever. The intelligence unit is where we do strategy research uh, and uh, we're about to launch our new brandscape reports covering each segment of the market. So that's sort of who we are, who I am, and that's what we do. So what are we here to talk about today? We're going to talk a little bit about the market. I'm going to tell you everything you need to know uh, going into this space. Take this plan today, you'll go out, you'll, you'll be successful, go public, get rich. It's, it's all here in these slides, uh, which I'll distribute. Actually, I couldn't possibly do that, but I do have a few tips. I, I tell you some things you need to know, a few trends that are current right now, uh, and a few tips. I can't possibly hit them all, uh, but uh, we can speak to them all, uh, maybe not during, but after, uh, during questions. So when, when I talk about uh, the HCM, human capital management, you know, there, there's, there's a market and there's a segment. As a, as a market, if we look at the classic technology adoption life cycle, we say that HCM is, is very mature. Uh, when we get into segments, most of them are, and segments would be things like talent acquisition is a segment, HR uh, under HCM is a segment, payroll, engagement, uh, there, there are, uh, a, it's a growing list of segments um, and, and markets, if you will, that you may, you may operate within with your solutions. Most of the vendors uh, go from early mainstream uh, to mature, and very rarely, um, and I hope I'm not disappointing anyone, but we, there, there are some really rare early adopter you know, segments. Um, there isn't a lot that we see come into the space that we haven't seen done before. It may be a new way to solve a problem. But, uh, but it's, it's, you know, very, very rarely are there solutions that people haven't adopted before or sort of looking at the bigger market. When you start to narrow it down and think about the market segments, enterprise and SMB, you start to see more green fields uh, for, uh, for different uh, segments within the space. Most of the uh, market has been really saturated and Taurus did a great job it's almost impossible to count the number of vendors in this space because the barrier to entry, as you all know, is very low. Um, talent acquisition is, uh, a, is a place where we see a lot of new entries, a lot of activity. Uh, my friends at uh, the Brandon Hall Group have been putting a, a, a yeoman's work into trying to get their arms around talent acquisition. Uh, they speculate that it's just in talent acquisition in every every flavor of it, point solutions, platforms, et cetera, 600 to 700 solutions just in that space. And we, we used to think back in the 90s that what will happen in, in that segment and the other segments is that we'll see consolidation take place uh, over time. And sure, we've seen consolidation. We've seen mergers, acquisitions, but uh, it is dwarfed by the new entries coming into the market. Uh, so we do have a lot, we have market leaders in each segment that own about uh, somewhere between 20-30% of the market and then it is like slicing the pizza in you know quarter inch slices for all of the other vendors if you will. Um, I've got the obligatory uh, logo slides just to reinforce how you know how many brands there are out there. We think the market's incredibly undersized, undervalued. 
uh, we look at, uh, we partner with all of the traditional tech analysts and we've looked at all their numbers. Usually you hear things like, well, human capital is about an 11 billion market. I don't know a human capital vendor that only does one thing. If we're talking core HR, it's probably about an, bless you, it's probably about an 11 billion dollar market. But when we start looking at, you know, well, let's add payroll to that, let's add talent management, let's add services, let's add, let's add outsourcing, let's add engagement, let's add consulting. Um, it, this number might even be low, but we view it, it's no niche. We're, we're not, we, we used to talk about HR technology and human capital management on the, as, a, as a market, as a niche. Uh, it's no niche. This is right up there with CRM. This is right up there with B2B cloud services. Uh, this is, uh, this is a, 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 a B2B segment that's attracting a lot of attention. And uh, it's no coincidence that uh, investors are, are running the conference today, right? So um, if, if we look at the segments um, between enterprise and SMB, uh, we say that enterprise is the market where you've got 5,000 employees and above. Everybody that I talk to slices this differently, but this is how I'm speaking to it today. What are the characteristics there? In that space, Taurus mentioned it, um, this is the place where it takes a long time to sell software. People like to buy platforms. They don't like to buy point solutions, or at least the, our research and just about everybody's research shows that. Uh, they don't want to buy a point solution. Uh, they want to buy something that solves a problem, you know, end to end. They want to extend their uh, SAP success factors. They want to extend their Oracle uh, into the, uh, the organization. Um, so it's, it's a very saturated end of the market uh, because that's, that's where all the attention has been since the beginning of the market. Um, and we'll talk about some of that as well. The good news, the opportunity there is that there's a lot of brand fatigue. A lot of these brands, even the ones that I just mentioned, uh, it's like, you know, these are the companies everybody uh, loves to hate. You know, it's, it's there, there are a lot of usability issues. There are, there's, there, there's a uh, latest research that, that we've done with uh, Human Resource uh, Executive Magazine and all of the other analysts that we work with uh, shows anywhere from uh, 15 to 25 percent of enterprise shops switching their uh, HCM technology in the next couple of years. So uh, that's a big, you think about those implementations, that's a, that in implementations, that's a big churn to go through. Now the SMB, so everybody else under, that's, that's where the bulk of employment is in the US and, and really around the world. Uh, these folks, you know, f where, where HR technology started like in the 50s and 60s with payroll uh, via service providers and then uh, technology interfaces, these folks started using payroll and other HR services, staffing, et cetera, really as uh, just by necessity uh, in the 90s, uh, you started to see some spotty usage of enterprise software, but it was like, hey, there's an opportunity here. Let's dumb down the interface and sell light enterprise software to small businesses. It hasn't gone really well uh, for the SMB. Uh, most of the SMB is currently, and I've, we, I just finished a project uh, looking at the SMB for uh, actually a couple of projects in a couple of different segments, and it's amazing to me the research that we do and then the follow on interviews, people are still moving from Excel. So we live in this HR technology bubble of uh, you know, interfaces and platforms to do everything from recruiting to succession planning, performance management, et cetera. Most folks are still uh, doing it all with uh, the, the, the Microsoft Office suite of products. Uh, that's, that's how they're managing a lot of this flow until they get to a point where the pain is so big that they need to start automating <clears throat> or the opportunity is big from a strategic perspective and they, they understand that talent uh, is, is where they need to focus their, their energies. So uh, this is very different from a, buy, a selling and buying perspective. Here you can see, you know, you can see uh, self-service. You, know, you can see you know, online transactions. You see sales cycles less than 30 days. Uh, here you can sell more of a point solution. You can sell uh, into more of a uh, departmental uh, space without running into that platform issue. And I'm not saying that those opportunities don't exist 
in the enterprise space. I'm just talking about where there's less friction um, in, in the market. This is how the SMB breaks down, just to put a finer point on it. And the segment, so I, I talk about the SMB a lot, and I had one guy in New York, and he looked at me and he said, you know, but your dry cleaner doesn't want to buy a, a, a system for talent management. And so the answer to that is, well, the segment with between 100 and 4,099 4 employees is 42 times bigger. There are 42 times the number of firms in that segment than 5,000 and above. These are not small companies, and some of the bigger brands in retail uh, and uh, services are operating in this segment. And they're not just operating domestically. Uh, it's, it is becoming a, a flatter world. We're dealing with global issues. So these are, these are not, when you get up to three, 4,000 employees, these are not necessarily easy problems to solve uh, for a tech vendor, but uh, this is where a lot of the opportunity is, and we actually see the enterprise vendors coming downstream into the SMB uh, as well. A lot of innovation here. I, it's been almost, relatively speaking, overnight uh, in the last year or two. Uh, I would I probably take, depending on the year, and uh, it's you know 150 demos, br you know briefings from vendors, and. Uh, it's almost shifted, I'd say in the last year or two, definitely in the last six months, more than 50% are focused on the SMB. Uh, they see this opportunity. Uh, there are a lot of trends that, that speak to this. Uh, you know, the accessibility to just things like bandwidth, uh, but you know, cloud-based cloud solutions, et cetera. Um, folks using Google to find vendors, uh, vendors can find buyers, buyers can find vendors more easily. It used to be back uh, in the uh, 90s, early 2000s, you couldn't find the buyers in the SMB because they don't go to the trade shows, they don't operate, they don't, they don't join SHRM, they don't show up in, in the, at the events, but now you don't need those venues as much as uh, the, the web is helping us find each other. So anyhow, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. What you need to know. We talked about competing with brands. Why, when does brand matter? And I, there's a capital B, I understand, on this slide. Because it's a title, but uh, we, I like to say it's, uh, it's a lowercase b. I'm not talking about your, the colors on your website and the look and the feel and which stock photos you choose. That's all really important, and the folks on the agency side spend a lot of time and hours figuring that stuff out. I'm talking about uh, what does the market know you, what do they think of you, and... Uh, and, and what experience are they having? Uh, what do they think when they think of you? So uh, getting in the door. Have I heard of this solution before? If I'm at a larger SMB shop or in the enterprise space, or almost any, everybody's asking this question, and this is the first place from a, from a going to market perspective, people struggle with brand, and a lot of times they don't even, they don't even think about brand when their salespeople are coming back and saying, Nobody's heard of us. They don't know about us. So what are we going to do? We're going we're gonna to go try to prime the pump with leads or whatnot. We'll get into how to do that. Getting the deal closed. Maybe you're getting in the door. Sure, we'll take a look at you. We don't know you, but that sounds pretty compelling. You're a really good salesperson. I, I got your email. Looks good. Uh, but now I've got to go tell my VP of HR or the CEO which solution we're going to select. And man, I'm taking a huge risk on your solution. And we've, we just finished research that shows this is, a, this is an issue. HR people are thinking about this when they're buying your product. Uh, is it a safe choice for me? And that's not all that earth shattering. I think everybody, that's, that's buyer behavior sort of 101, low risk in the beginning, high risk at the buying decision point. But y your brand is important at, also at the end of the sale. Think, think about it before you engage and we're gonna spend some time talking about how people find each other now and where you have opportunities to capitalize on that. They're not talking to vendors, they're talking to each other. Do you know of any, have you ever heard of any product that can help me with performance reviews or help me find good talent or help me, uh, you know, I, I've got a payroll system but I really wanna manage time more effectively. Or, you know, I, I really believe in this wellness thing. You know anything about that? You know any products like that? When the buyers are talking to each other, your brand matters there as well. Do, have they heard of you? Have they seen your stuff? And then of course on the renewal, uh, most of you are probably looking for uh, recurring revenue. That's, that's where we all wanna be. And uh, to, get, to get that renewal, the experience you're having with the customer, 
delivering on the promise that you've made to them, that's where your brand's going to have an impact there as well. Is it more risky for me to leave my current relationship than it is to go find a new vendor? What's, what's you know, how, that your brand matters there. So what, God, what's an emerging vendor to do? I mean, that just sounds scary, doesn't it? This is the thing. As a start, I, we've, you know, many of us in the room, it's not our first rodeo when it comes to startups. But man, did I love my first rodeo because what I didn't know didn't scare me, right? So that lack of expertise, I mean, I had been in the field and I had, I had done the recruiting thing, I had done the HR thing, and I knew how it worked. I really understood the buyer, but that lack of expertise, it really, it helped me innovate. So uh, it's, you can get such a new, per, uh, bring a new perspective to the market and I think uh, somebody, on the, was it you on the thread? Like you, you can, I can, I learned so much from every startup that I talked to um, in the aggregate, not every single startup, but uh, these ideas that hit me and it's, it's just, it's, it's great. Now, here's the thing, a lack of perspective can leave you looking like an idiot. So uh, what you don't want to do is go into the market. It's great to have that fresh perspective but you've got to do your homework because this is a saturated market. And whether you're in the SMB or the enterprise, you've got to have a little perspective about your buyer and about what and who you're up against before you go walking out into the space and prescribing solutions. So, so get some industry perspective. Many solutions that I find on the, um, so it, it's all about team, right? Many, many startups that I find, they, somebody had a good idea. They might not have been in this HR space or HR technology space. They solved a business problem. The founder's passionate about it. Uh, they had no idea about you know, the, the hundreds and hundreds and thousands of vendors that are out there. They don't care about it. Great idea, great product, great interface. Let's go. Well, get some expertise. Get somebody, get them in product, sales, marketing, leadership, services, wherever get some expertise to come in and help take that product to the next level. Get it wherever you can, and when you have it, if you have it, retain it. That's your talent, talent management uh, uh, objective, is to keep it on board. As the company grows from you know, the, you know, uh, A round to B round, or early to later stages, however you like to measure it, or, or however you think of it, um, don't shift those people to the, to the back seat put them in a role that challenges them and keep, keeps them innovating. Uh, it's really important because what ends up happening at some point is the investors are more interested in your financial metrics than they are your product engagement metrics or your customer satisfaction or success metrics. No offense to the investors in the room, but those are actually the things that are going to feed your brand later, um, even more so uh, than some of these, than you know, sort of cranking the cash machine uh, today. Create an advisory board and fill the gaps that you have uh, on your team from an expertise perspective. Don't do me a favor, I don't know how much of you are active in the blogs and whatnot. Don't go get the same five bloggers that everybody else has on their advisory boards. Uh, I'm starting to get a little embarrassed of, of some of that in the market. Uh, so don't just, you know, if, if your advisory board, if your intent with your advisors is to generate leads and generate uh, exposure, uh, you, you need to work the influencers and, and the bloggers and the advisors. Uh, pull one of them in. Pull, pull one, maybe even two, into your advisory board. But when I think of an advisory board, do I need help on, with my product? Do I need help in sales? Do I need some perspective on marketing, financials, operations, scale, sustainability? These are generally not those five bloggers that are, that are out there. And there are really probably ten of them, but I see a lot of... A lot of the same people. And how are you doing things differently if you're all working with the same five or 10 advisors? That, I always, I've started to wonder that. So align it to your critical functions and balance it with fresh perspective. Get the person who took the, the blue chip and the, the Fortune 500 company and did amazing things and get somebody from another startup in a similar segment or a completely different segment who's going to bring you something you didn't think of. Um, get, Bring one or two of those in as well. Know your goal. Um, honestly identify where your business is today and where you're trying to get to. And these goals vary. Uh, and this, is, this sounds like you know, motherhood and apple pie here. 
But um, I can't, I, I take those briefings and it amazes me how many people don't know where they're trying to go. They have, they have no idea where they're trying to get to uh, and they're just sort of out, you know, throwing their product out there and throwing some messages out there and trying to get to that next place, but they can't tell me what it is. Are you trying to get more funding? Are you trying to get from, you know, angel and, to, or, and or seed to series A or a B round or where are you trying to go? And then what are the, what are the metrics you need to measure to help get there? What are the things you need to achieve to get there? And, you know, maybe it's not, we all talk about financials, maybe it's about releasing your next product or releasing your product or getting to a minimally viable product at all. Or maybe it's about, you know, improving your engagement rates in your product. Whatever these, and it could be a few of these things, whatever these things are, know it and then focus on it. Focus. Be relentless about achieving that and review it. You know, are, are, uh, are any of you agile shops? Agile, agile. So, you know, look at it every couple of weeks. Where are we? Break it down into bite sized chunks. We're an agile shop. Every project we take, everything we do, we bring it, we bring it down to uh, each uh, uh, iterative deliverable and we look at it every single day, and then we step back every two weeks and look at how we're doing. And we've seen our NPS, stores, uh, NPS scores go through the roof, and we're watching revenue come along with it, and it, we stole it from the tech environment, right? It, to hear a strategy and marketing firm doing that, we took it from you guys, and it works. So, you know, think about that in your go-to-market and in your strategy uh, as well. I think there's an epidemic on um, lack of focus. Uh, in, it, like, I, I, I walk away from most of my calls with vendors uh, it's a very high percentage uh, feeling that there's a lack of focus, and I, I would, I would uh, encourage you to think about that. So here are some things, other things you need to know. Uh, know your competition, and yes, you have some. Everybody comes through the door and tells me nobody else is doing this, and that may be true. Nobody else set up the interface that way, but a lot of people are going after the same budget you're going after. So even if you are the only one to do what you do, and you're in wellness, uh, there are a lot of wellness shops out there, a lot of talent, acquisi talent acquisition shops out there, a lot of talent management shops out there, a lot of recruiting shops out there. So they might do it differently, they might even be solving a different problem, but you've got competition and know who's going after your buyer with going after the same dollars you're going after because that's, that's who you're going to bump into and that you're going to need, whether they're directly competing or not, is less relevant to me as whether they're competing at all. So uh, know the analysts, bloggers, thought leaders in your segment, know how you want to work with them, know what you want back from them, know what you have to give them, uh, and create relationships there. As a startup, uh, this is where you can get uh, some buzz. A lot of folks, they're just good people. They just, they're, they're passionate about this space. They're very interested in sharing with their communities. Um, what they see that's cool, who they see that they think will make it, who's emerging. Uh, there's, there's a lot of quid pro quo that's just the time and energy spent between the vendors and the thought leaders and analysts and so forth. Uh, know the events, know the publications, know who's writing about your segment or about the business issues that you help address and get to know these people. I saw um, uh, one of my uh, friends uh, at Black Book HR, these guys do, and it's an engagement tool, they're out of Cincinnati. And um, they went to HR, they're a startup, they're, you know, fairly early stage. Um, they were looking at, uh, you know, they, they were in the little startup pavilion, so they had like a little tiny tabletop like this, so not a big presence, if, at, if any, at the event. And they went to the event and beforehand because they registered, they got to see who uh, from the press and the media would be there. Their CEO saw that a writer from the Wall Street Journal would be there. He tweeted her up. They, they talked a little bit over Twitter before the event. They ended up getting mentioned in a journal article. And then a little startup gets mentioned in a journal, journal article because just because he took the time and the effort, he had a good story to tell, but he took, he, he took that initiative he saw that she's attending, she must be thinking about the workplace and HR technology. Uh, so look at those, those publications and those sites and, and, and think about that if you're looking to get some exposure. And it takes effort and focus and consistency. Know your radical buyer. 
So again, uh, focus, focus, focus. Everybody in the, and I've, I've got bullets somewhere else in the presentation. Everybody's out there saying the same things because you're all competing for the same dollars somewhere in the same department or the same org structure. And what happens is HR, the employee life cycle is a life cycle. It starts at you know, recruitment and it, and it goes all the way to retirement, and, because, and there are a million steps in between. And because of that, we all impact each other. You know, the best recruit, uh, if, I, if I recruit the best people, I'll, I'll be able to retain the best people if I make the right hires. And if I'm you know, retaining the best people, I'll be able to develop the best people so it impacts learning. And if I've got all the best people, then I've got the best people to do my succession planning with. And oh my God, now we're all saying the same things to the same buyers and it gets really confusing. But your buyers are the, your radical buyers. It's a concept that we've come up with. These are the people who are going to identify not with your everything to everyone message, but with the message that says, we know who you are and we know your business problem and we know what you're up against and we're going to help you and my message is tailored to you in your industry, in your segment. Uh, we know, we understand more than your demographic. Everybody's looking for the VP of HR in a company with X to Y employees. Everybody's targeting that mythical person. You want the person who is, you know, let's say you're in engagement. You want the, uh, and your, your solution is skewed toward learning as the future of, of, of the organization. You want the person who's concerned about engagement, believes that, that a learning employee is an engaged employee, and you want the person who understands that that employee is going to contribute more to your bottom line than anybody else. You want to build message, that's just one example. I can slice it a million ways, but you want to message to that person and polarize the rest of the market. You're doing a service to the market when you do that because the buyers all want to know who should I talk to and who shouldn't I talk to. Get specific and get focused with who your real buyer is because they're going to be your most passionate and your most profitable buyers and your biggest advocates. They're going to talk to each other. They're going to bring you more people just like them and focus on them and be truthful and honest with them and be transparent with them. There's, a, there's something that um, uh, I heard it from uh, people in this room before and uh, it's transparency in your terms and transparency in your pricing be real with your buyers and direct with your buyers and that you're going to and you'll get it back uh, tenfold please market and sell in this decade so back in the 90s we said and it, and it was i think there was research that probably validated it all it said hr is technology averse they hate it they don't want it scared of it they're frightened of it um, hr not strategic don't just, I'm going to get one tip. This is worth the whole session. Don't go say seat at the table in front of anybody who's buying anything HR or talent related. You're welcome. Um, right. But don't say, don't tell people you're trying to help them find a seat at the table because they're going to, they're, they're, you're, you're, you've lost the deal at that point when you, when you say that. Uh, this is real. You know, HR loves cats, the whole cat lady, cat thing. Uh, HR can't buy our product alone. They're not even, even empowered to buy it. Well, we know a few, we've done a lot of research for real, and we know a few things. HR is more educated than the rest of the organization. They've got more advanced degrees than anybody, anybody else in the organization, all their peers. They've come from the field. They've spent time in product, in uh, sales, in marketing, and operations, and moved into HR. It's been, you know, 25 years since 1990s, folks. Some folks actually were born, and now they're in HR now, <laughs> at the point where you were stereo we were stereotyping them. Uh, some of them were 15 years old, and now they are your buyer. Now they're 40. So uh, HR is actually split. We, this is a fact between dogs and cats. It's 50-50, so they're just like all the rest of us. It's not the cat lady, forget that stuff. Um, HR is a newly empowered buyer because everybody's a newly empowered buyer. I need, but we need to find new, new people. We need to get new blood into the organization, skilled talent. Well, the tools that those buyers have, they're, they're going so far down the buying path before they ever contact you. 
before they ever contact you. Every buyer is a newly empowered buyer. And nobody can buy your product alone. I mean, unless you're selling something for under $1,000, nobody, nobody wants to buy your product alone. Who wants to buy a solution they're going to put in front of their entire team without some buy-in? We've been selling to a sphere of influence since there was selling, right? I can't, I can't buy a car without my wife's input. I mean, there's a, there's a little sphere of influence right there. Here's, here's the thing. If you go out, look, remember that radical buyer concept, pol concept, polarize the market? If you market and sell to that person, guess who you're going to find? You're going to find that person. I'm sorry, man, this, I don't get this technology. I'm scared of it. Uh, I, I really don't have a strategic vision for how this is going to help my organization. Um, I, 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 got, I got to bring in a committee because I'm so scared of it and I don't get it. Uh, and, you know, I just want to go home and be with my cats, right? That's who you're going to find. Go find this, go find this person. Go, find, go market and sell to a newly empowered buyer in this decade who is solving business problems in their organization. Go find your radical buyer. Um, we talked about the SMB. I'm not going to beat that one to death. Um, the newly empowered buyers. I mentioned some of this. Customer advocacy is, is a, uh, the 57% stat, by the way, is from the conference executive board. Uh, they've got a great book, The Challenger Sale. It talks about, it's sort of like the, uh, with all the shift to content marketing and thought leadership, is anybody trying to do like content, put content out to drive SEO and drive leads? So this is a big, um, it works, it really does work. But the thing is marketing has been doing that. And then um, it used to be that when somebody hit your website after seeing your message, they were just requesting a demo. They wanted to learn, they wanted to see your product. I, I wrote a blog post last year, I should just publish it every quarter. The title says it all, just because they downloaded your ebook doesn't mean they wanna buy your product. There's a, uh, people have called it inbound selling, content selling. There's a, a connection uh, that needs to be made from content marketing and thought leadership into the sales cycle. And it's the difference between, I saw you hit the website, can I schedule a demo? T to, I noticed that you downloaded our, our piece on the future of the contingent workforce. Uh, what was it that interested you about that? What, what, what struck your fancy there? You're not sure? Well, let me tell you about a few of the peak companies we work with. Here's what they're doing. Here's what they were thinking about. That's why we wrote the piece. Does that interest you? Let's talk about that business issue. That's a very different approach when you're in a content-driven world. And what's happening is, you know, especially the startups, they, they, you have limited funds. You spend the money or you spend the resources on a nice ebook, a nice infographic, whatever. You put it out there and it's like, the conversion rates are terrible. You know, we're, we brought the leads in and, you know, the salespeople are like, where are the Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross leads? These leads suck. And then it's back and forth. But in reality, we just need to be having a conversation with the right people, having delivered the right message and then getting them to the, it's, it's, it's about a, you know, we used to talk about relationships and it's, it's about a conversation. It's about having the right story for the right audience. Um, engagement and experience. So I put them together because this is how I, I, when I did this, I thought, you know, engagement itself is, is a big trend right now, whether we're in, from all perspectives, candidate engagement, employee engagement, customer engagement, user engagement, uh, it, it can go on. Uh, experience, candidate experience, employee experience, customer experience, user experience, UX. But here's the thing, they belong together. It's all one thing now. It's all one thing. Your, your candidates are your potential customers, are your potential users. It's all, it's all and potential employees, it's, it's all related. And, and that's what the, our current, the, the technology trends, social, mobile, UX, et cetera, you know, transparency, you know, information being shared among, among buyers, 57% of it before they contact you, has created this environment where you, you need to em embrace that and start being honest and transparent. I'm not saying anyone in this room isn't honest. Taurus loves you all, so I love you all. But, uh, but we need to embrace that transparency with all, you know, appropriately with each of these constituencies. Here are the trends you might have been looking for. So we did some research with Human Resource Executive Magazine. 
the top five things on the mind of uh, the HR buyer. Uh, on top is performance management. Next was uh, employee engagement measurement, uh, learning, leadership development, and then HR analytics. Um, I'm not surprising anybody in the room. What's missing from the top five? There's one big one that was like, hey, talent acquisition. Where's talent acquisition? Don't worry, we, they're still spending on talent acquisition and they always will, but these are the five things that are keeping the, you know, think of the uh, large, mid to enterprise level buyer. These are the five things that are keeping them up at night um, in their organization. They're budgeting, they're spending in talent acquisition, but think about this, the shift in talent acquisition from, you know, uh, we're, we're sort of, we've gotten beyond just process automation we're sort of, we're, we're, we're at way out of that early adopter sort of phase. We're well into the mainstream uh, and heading into mature in that category. So that, that's, that's sort of what that means there. There's a, there is a spend, um, so I don't mean to, I don't want to scare anybody, but those are your top five. All right, so here are a few tips. I talked about the, the epidemic being lack of focus. Don't be everything to everyone. Talked about this. Uh, don't try to do everything in your product. Don't try to solve all of HR's problems in your product. And certainly don't, don't confuse your messages that way, uh, your marketing message that way. Polarize the buyers in your market um, in verticals, geographies, roles, and personas. So um, I'm going to spend a little more time on that on the next slide. So, you know, n narrow your focus and think about where you can be successful um, and think about what those business goals are. Back to the original, one of the first slides, those KPIs, where am I trying to take this HR technology company? And, and what do I need to get there? Am I trying to build a sustainable revenue model and, and a track and performance to get that next level of funding? Because that's what all the VC wanted when I've gone through it. So what do I need to do to, to, to get that? Do I blanket the United States with my, with my few dollars in a resource thin environment? Or do I narrow and get more for my money by being more narrowly focused to, to drive that, that performance? And, and then you will empower and enable your teams if you have that focus. So now own your focus. So that a little bit more about narrowing that focus. Um, just because you're a startup doesn't mean that you can't uh, own a, a market, a geography, uh, a metro, or if you're going after enterprise level customers, marquee brand names, if you will, you need to, you need to narrow that focus so that you can own it. So if you're the, uh, you know who does a great job here in New York of that is Namely. So it's a uh, HR solution, HR and payroll, uh, SMB focused, uh, you know, growing, you know, rapidly. And there are times where you can't go get a taxi without seeing their name go by, but they're not doing it all over the country. And they're not, they're, 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 they've got a very strategic way to do that. There are some other vendors that do it in smaller uh, markets. They do similar stuff, even outdoor physical advertising. Or own a publication, own a segment. Own, own it so that when you're, you know, you know your radical buyer, you've, you've identified that if you're following one of my first steps. You know where they are, you know who they read, where they go what they're thinking about, then be where they are. And there are digital strategies to go after them, targeting, retargeting, geo-targeting, even, even just online that are very uh, cost effective. Own it, own that, own, own a smaller, we, we like to say get small to get big. Bring your focus down small, drive results. If you own New York, you, that's a, that's, this, is a, this is like a world economy right here. You can, you can go horizontally from there. You can go to other segments. You can go to other cities. Maybe, maybe it's not just New York. Maybe you own New York and Dallas and San Francisco. But stop, blank, stop trying to be everything to everyone and sell everything to everyone. You can follow me on Twitter and email me.